All right, welcome back. So today we're going to start a new unit. Uh, and the truth is we really only spend about a day or two on this unit. It's a very short unit. Um, and what I did is pulled out the big things that are important to history, and I'm covering them in notes. So we really didn't do a huge book assignment. So really while you're taking these notes, obviously you need to get out the guided notes for Mass Society and Democracy. I believe our sub gave you a copy of these. If not, please hand them out today. Also, make sure you have out your semester review guide. Get the whole semester test review. And if you'll turn to page six, you will see that um, this information, most of it, will be covered in these notes. There may be a few that you need to look up in your book, but that's the chapter that we're covering. So you can fill these out as we go along. All right. So the first thing that uh, we need to talk about is the word industrialization. And that's really what this chapter is about. We're seeing huge growth as a nation, um, especially over in Europe and then eventually in the United States. And if you look at the word industrialization, what do you notice is the base word? Right, industry, right? Industry. So a good way to remember the name uh, or what this word means is to look at that base word. It is the beginning of big industry, big cities and big factories like you see here in this picture. Now we haven't figured out the whole pollution thing or the safety of machines and whatnot, but we are seeing huge growth in cities. People are moving to the cities. We're seeing lots of inventions too. And where did it start? In England. This is where industrialization really started booming and then eventually it caught on in America, for example, a few years later. All right, so there's like a hodgepodge of stuff in this chapter. You're gonna see it's really bizarre. So the first thing I wanna talk about is how we got into World War I as a country. And the funny thing is this chapter isn't even about World War I, but the setup to that war happens during this time period. We're talking like 1880 to 1910 is the era we're in. So here's what I remember learning in high school. I remember them saying, well, some guy got killed over by Serbia somewhere, and that's why we fought World War I. Well, I studied it for my test. I memorized it, but it never made any sense to me at all. So my hope today is that I'm going to help you understand what in the world this guy getting killed over by Serbia has anything to do with us. Okay? So, um, first of all, here's what happens. We have a crisis in the Balkans. Austria-Hungary is imperializing. And again, what is imperializing? Yep, to take territories for our country, for ourselves, right? Well, Austria-Hungary was just like us. They wanted territories. And so they went in and they annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina and took those territories for their own. Well, there was a country nearby that wasn't real happy about that. Serbia was right next door, if you remember our map on the previous slide. They are outraged because they wanted that territory for themselves, and here these people over in Austria come and take their territory. They wanted that land for themselves. So then what happens is the king, or the Archduke Ferdinand, of Austria goes to visit his new territory over in Bosnia. And while he's there, the Serbs kill him because they're so angry about what he's done. Now, this is the part I remember learning. Well, this guy got killed and that's why we fought in World War I. So what does that have to do with the United States? Well, the best way to understand this is to think of it like a fight, a fight between two people at school. So let's imagine that um, Serbia is, well, no, let's make Austria-Hungary Braden. So Braden, you're going to represent Austria-Hungary. And Serbia is going to be Jackson playing. Braden, I heard Jackson wants to beat you up after school today. And you know how tough Jackson is. He's kind of a scary guy. So um, you're going to have a fight after school. Well, the problem is that, um, Braden, your friend Randa is a little bit worried about you because, you know, Jackson is a tough guy. So, Randa, 
Are you going to just go ahead and let your friend Braden go fight? Or are you going to back up your buddy? Of course you're going to back up your buddy. So Randa decides to go to the fight and make sure that her buddy Braden is okay. Well, you know what, Haley? You're a buddy of Jackson's, right? You hang out and you just heard that Randa and Braden are going to like gang up on Jackson. It's gonna be two to one. And you're really worried about him. Are you going to just let Jackson go in and get beat up? Or are you going to support your buddy? Of course, you're going to support your buddy. So Haley shows up to support Jackson. Now we have four people at the fight. But you know what, Haley? You have some friends that are concerned too. Chase, you're a good friend of Haley's, aren't you? Chase is worried about Haley because, you know, Chase has heard that Randa has some pretty sharp nails and she could tear some eyes out. So she's, he's tried to convince Haley not to go, but she's like, nope, I got to back up Jackson. Chase, are you going to back up your buddy Haley to make sure she's all right? Or are you going to just let her hang? Of course, you're going to back your buddy's play. So you show up to fight. Well, it doesn't end there. Because you know what, Macy, you're a friend of Chase's, right? And you know that Chase gets in trouble all the time. He's always getting himself in trouble and you gotta help him out. And you're so worried that this big guy, Braden, is just gonna pummel this guy. So are you going to back your buddy's play? Of course you are. So now look at what's just happened here. We started out with a fight between Braden and Jackson, just two people. But because of buddies and people that you're friends with, we now end up having, what, six people at the fight after school. And that is basically what happened that led us into World War I. Let's see what I mean by that. Watch this. All right. Well, here's the thing. Germany is buddies with Austria-Hungary. So they say, listen, we will back you in your fight, so we're going to go and help you out. But now Serbia has a friend too, right? And that friend is Russia. And Russia wants to make sure that they support Serbia. So now we've got four countries involved in the fight. But it doesn't stop there. Russia has a friend. And that friend is basically England and France. And they don't Russia to get they don't want Russia to get in there and get slaughtered. So they go in to like support Russia. And it doesn't end there. Can you guess who is friends with England? Yes. Throughout history, other than the American Revolution, the U.S. has been buddies with England. So the U.S. goes in to support England and France because those are our allies. And they get drawn into World War I because of those friends. The U.S. could really honestly care less about Serbia. In fact, we really don't like Serbia very much at this time. But we are concerned about England and France. And so because of that, it pulls us into the war. Make sense? I hope so. Awesome. Okay, so some new things that are happening around this time period. We have some new styles of literature. It is called a naturalist style. These writers believe that writing should be realistic and address social problems. And quite often they will write about some issue that they want to change in society, like women's rights, alcoholism, urban slums. In fact, one of the most famous naturalist writers is a guy named Upton Sinclair, who wrote the book, The Jungle. I don't know if you've studied that in English, but he basically had a spy go in and kind of observe what happened in meatpacking plants back in the day. And they could not believe the stuff that went into your meat, like uh, nails, rusty nails, um, the water that you used to wash your hands was dumped into the vats with all the meat. They used all the scraps and ends of the animals and threw those in. In fact, they even found that rats would go and like poop on the meat. And so then they would put out poison for the rats and kill the rats and they wouldn't even stop to take out a rat. So rat pieces and the rat poop and the poison would all get mixed in with your hamburger for dinner tonight. Yep, I know you're all hungry. 
not only that, but he was talking about the conditions of these workers and how they were basically like robots, just going through the motions, trying to get as much done as they could, but they were worked to death, and they were like zombies in their own lives. So it was a really important book. This is why we have the USDA that inspects meatpacking plants today, because of that book and that writer. Now, when, I, when you heard this definition of what a naturalist is, did it remind you of a certain painting style we've studied? That is correct. Realism, remember over here on the board, we said realist painters paint it just like it is. They usually have a social or political message. Same kind of thing, only this is in writing. Good. A couple of famous names that your book mentions are people like Henrik Ibsen and Emil Zola. All right. We also have what are called symbolist writers becoming popular. These people encourage writers to express their ideas, feelings, and values by using, you got it, symbols or suggestion rather than by saying it straight out. Lots of symbolism. Uh, they believe that the imagination is the true interpreter of reality. So let me give you an example. In your book, they talk about a guy named Charles Baudelaire, this kind of famous symbolist writer. And here's just an example of his piece of work called The Flowers of Evil. And as I read this, see if you can figure out what he's talking about. Psalm of life. Art is long and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, still, like muffled drums, are beating. Funeral marches to the grave. So what is he basically talking about? Yeah, he's talking about our step-by-step -step road to death, basically. And when he talks about our hearts, like muffled drums are beating, think of that heartbeat. And it keeps beating until we eventually die, and there is no drum beat anymore. So you notice how he's using symbolism and pretty words and descriptive words instead of just saying, yeah, our heart beats until we croak and then our heart just stops. Okay, It's a little prettier than that. All right, we also have four styles of art in this chapter. I mentioned that before, but I'll tell you what. When you learn about these four, you'll see that they're pretty easy to identify. Our first style is Impressionism. These people, are, it's so logical, but this is what they did. Instead of painting in studios, they realized we need to go outside to paint. So if you've ever seen pictures of people sitting up on a mountain and they're painting the view of the sunset, these would be impressionists. Um, and the reason they did that is because they realized that if I sat in a studio and did a painting of a sunset, it's not gonna look exactly like it would if I actually looked at the scene of that sunset. Sorry, my volume's kind of loud. Uh, landscape is hugely important to these people because it's about the beauty of, of the world. Uh, but they are discovering how light affects that picture. Those of you that are artists, you know this, but people like me didn't always understand this until I studied it. They realized that you never use true black in any real painting. Because when light shines on black, it makes it look a little different. So if you can even look at um, someone in here that has a black sweatshirt on, for example, and if you take a look at how the light shines on that black, you'll see that the area where the light shines is a different color black than where it's shadowed, okay? Same thing with white. Pure white does not exist. Look at the board up in front here, the white board, right? Do you see other colors in the white board? Notice how the Christmas lights might actually reflect different colors and change that white. So we might have to add a little bit of pink when we paint a picture of this white board. Uh, the shadows may change things. If I face this board, I can, I can actually see the reflection of all of the lights in the ceiling to the back of the room. In fact, I can even see the doorway if I look straight at it. So from your angle, notice that it's not all just one color white. 
you, you mix different colors in. And it's because they went outside that they realized that light has an effect on things. So one thing I would look for, they never use all black and all white. They're going to mix colors in with that. You'll also notice visible brush strokes where they will actually use the end of a brush and like blot it like this. Only imagine a brush, okay? Or they might even use the ends like this to make texture. Of course, it's all about light. I mentioned that before. They'll use pretty ordinary subject matter. It's not gonna be like a famous scene necessarily. You will see some movement and some unusual visual angles. But I would focus on these things right here. Those are the things you want to look for for Impressionism. Let's look at some examples. Monet is probably the most famous Impressionist painter. <clears throat> now take a look at this scene. This is a scene of a forest with a lake in front of it. Now when I was a little kid, if I colored a lake, it was usually what color? Yeah, it was usually blue or like a blue-green, and we colored it all the same color. But notice what colors are in this lake because of light. We have orange because of the sunlight reflected on here. We have greens, we have yellows because of light. We even see the trees reflected in the water here. So it's not just your plain blue like you normally would. Notice we even see shadows of the boat. Here's your boat, but you see shadows in the water. Also, can you see the brush strokes? Take a notice here at the brush strokes you see down in here. Very cool. This one is done by a guy named Renoir, another famous um, impressionist. Again, take a look at our lake. You can actually see the reflection of the house in the water and the boat. You can see the girls in here. And notice that we don't have an all bright white dress. She's got a mix of blue and gray, depending on where the sunlight is hitting them. I like this one because this is a really good example of what we talked about with that dress. Look at this dress was supposed to be yellow. But look at all the different colors that Morso has put into that dress. Everything from browns to blacks to even some red because of the different shading that happens. Look at the visible brush strokes in this one. That's another one that's really obvious. Okay. So that's Impressionism. The next area is post-Impressionism. Post meaning after, right? Well, they basically use color and structure to express a mood. And of course, they basically rejected Impressionism. That's why it's post-Impressionism. Um, they developed a new method of paint application by viewing that scene or that piece from multiple angles. And that is even more important. The angle is more important than the subject matter. You're going to see they reject recording light. So you're not going to see that sun, sunlight in the water. They don't want to do that. They're not even going to show shading. No shading at all. You'll see a very, very bright palette, lots of bright colors. And to me, it looks like if I had a Polaroid of a picture of like a mountain scene, for example, a picture, they did like a cartoon of the original picture. At least that's what it looks like to me. Let me give you some examples. This one is done by Cezanne. Now take a look at this. We have a light in this picture, and it's the sun on the left side, right? But you'll notice that they're not using shading on the mountain. So normally, it would be light on this side of the mountain, and it would be shaded darker on this side. They are completely rejecting that, aren't they? Notice they're even using brighter colors that we wouldn't normally use for a regular, beautiful landscape scene. Bright colors, in fact, um, one of the things you might even notice about post-impressionists is they actually take a black line and they outline it and then they color it in with their paint. Because they don't care that it's not realistic. That's not the purpose. 
Van Gogh is probably the most famous post-impressionist. You've even studied this, I bet, Starry Night. Notice the bright, bright colors. Notice he's not trying to show us reality. There is no shading. There's nothing like that. Um, in fact, it's almost kind of like a cartoon, isn't it? You'll see he outlines the houses in black that you see down here. And then we've got those really bright colors. Very cartoony in my eyes anyway. And then we have an invention that actually changes art forever. And that is, you are correct, the first camera. A guy named George Eastman created the first Kodak camera in 1888, and Kodak is still around today. Although, boy, have things changed. We can actually take photos with our, our iPod and with our phones and everything. Well, this changed art because before this, if I wanted a portrait of my family, what did I have to do? I had to actually hire a painter to do a painting of my family. In fact, even my, my parents, when they were in high school, they didn't do like a, a, a picture like we do today. They actually did a painting. So, and that would take hours to do. Well, now we have a camera that can do that for us. They can take a picture of our family portrait. So this gives artists the freedom to do anything that they want. And they go a little bit crazy, they really do. Now I'm not saying that we don't have artists that do portraits today, because you still can. But it really gave them the freedom to do anything they want. So let's take a look at what they did. We have a new style called cubism. Take a look at the base word. It is, yes, cube. A big clue for you. Cubism used geometric designs to create reality. So we're going to use shapes, aren't we? Cubes, squares, circles, ovals, stars, all kinds of geometric shapes. They will view human form from many sides. Of course, they believe symbolic forms show the essence of ideas. So there's a lot of symbolism. You'll often find still lifes, um, like a table with a bunch of bottles on it or a guitar leaning against it, musical instruments. You'll find a lot of things like that. You might also find, this is some stuff that people don't realize, they may use um, like cutouts of advertisements or cutouts of cartoons or even like lyrics from a song or actually the notes from a song. Those would be considered cubism, believe it or not. In fact, some of them will even include numbers or parts of words in their painting. So if you look over at the new paintings over here on uh, the whiteboard to my right, okay, you'll see there's a like an off-white picture right in the middle, number 11. And you'll notice there are words on there. That is actually a cubist painting, believe it or not. Now, while I'm talking about that board on the right, this is also another opportunity for extra credit where you can practice these four different styles. You'll see that they have a little sticky tack on each thing. And what you do is you pull out, if someone could do this for me. Uh, for example, in cubism, there's a C. You pull out a C and you actually stick it on whichever thing you think is a cubist painting. And when you're all done, I'll check it for you and you can get your extra credit points. So just an opportunity for you. So let's look at some examples of cubism now. The guy that invented cubism is this guy right here, Pablo Picasso. This is titled Weeping Woman. Now, can you actually see the woman in the picture? Yes, we know there's a woman in the picture, but you'll notice he is using shapes to create that person. So we have uh, circles here, right? We've got a square here. We've got triangles, right? We've got all kinds of shapes that he's using to make this picture. Now remember, the other characteristic is showing many angles. And if you look at this picture, you'll notice it's not always clear exactly where her fingers are on her face. And it's because he basically took three poses. So imagine I kind of have my heel of my hand under my chin, 
my fingers are up on my cheek. That was one pose that she did. Another one, her fingers were up by her eyes and they added that to the picture. So you're seeing that there's fingers here, there's fingers up here, and then they combine them all into the same picture. That's what gives it that mysterious kind of look. Let's look at another one that's one of my favorites. This one is done by Marcel Duchamp, and this is called Nude Descending a Staircase, number two. So first of all, do you see the nude descending a staircase? If you don't, the first thing to look for is look for the stairs. See them right here? Okay. So now look for the bend in the knee. You notice the knees are bending as they go down the stairs here. And what they've done, so imagine, I go down step number one, they take a picture. I go down step number two, they take a picture. And three and four. And then he puts all of those pieces together into one, one particular painting. So they're showing the movement of this person working their way down the stairs. The face is somewhere along here as it goes down. And the body is somewhere in the middle of that. But this is a really good example of what we mean by multiple angles of movement. And again, we're using shapes, aren't we? All right, our last style. So cubism, easy to find, right? Our last style is even easier. This is abstract painting. This is the style of painting that you might have seen and you might have said something like this. Oh my gosh, my two-year-old brother could do a painting like that. And I'll be honest, yes, I've said the same thing about these paintings, but it wasn't until I really studied what they're doing that I have an appreciation for it. So let me see if I can maybe change your mind a little bit. All right. These people are avoiding reality altogether. For example, you saw Picasso was showing a woman that was crying. We could see the woman. They aren't trying to make you see a woman, for example. They believe that art should speak directly to the soul of the viewer, you, the person looking at the picture. They use only line and color, and it is up to you to decide what you actually see in the picture. So let's take a look. Kandinsky was a really great um, painter for this era. Notice the title of this is Yellow, Red, Blue, because he's not trying to tell you, I want you to see a new descending staircase. He just gives it a generic name. Then it's up to you to figure out what you see. So take a look at it. What do you see in the picture? Now, normally I would have you share a couple of ideas. Let me just give you some that my students have mentioned, okay? Some people say that this looks like a person's nose with their eye here and their hair right here um, from a side view. Some people say that this looks like a Rubik's Cube. Others say it looks like a dance floor in a disco or something like that. But remember that it's all in the view of the eye of the viewer, right? So if I was from Africa and I've never seen a Rubik's Cube, I would not see the same thing as you, right? It's all about our own impressions and our background. This here, some people say it looks like hairspray being sprayed. Some people say that it looks like a lighthouse, whereas another person said it looked like a basketball court. But imagine it from the top down. So here's the place where you check in at the table, and here's the basket, and then imagine your floor here, right? You're going this way or this way. There's lots of stuff you can see. And that is what makes this kind of painting really cool. I could go to the nearest art museum and I could sit down with my friend Melanie and we could sip on some coffee and just sit there and look at this painting and talk about the things that she sees and that I see. It's a discussion piece. And that's what makes it kind of unique. Here's another one by Kandinsky. Notice it's titled Composition Number Eight. So there are at least seven others. Again, he's not leaving you. Again, look for different things that you might see in here. Some people said this looked like a record. Some people said it looked like um, the sun being blotted out. Uh, I've had people say that these look like, um, what's that game uh, where you hit the ball through the little hoops in the yard? Croquet. 
Some have said it looks like the back of different seats in a theater. Some say they look like hills. Uh, some people believe this looks like a, a target that you're shooting arrows at. Or others say that it looks like a, a compass. This is kind of a fun one. If you can actually like cover up this portion here with your arm, they believe it looks like the side of a ship coming out from behind a building. So imagine your building is right here and it's coming out this direction. Here's your water line and there's your ship coming out. So lots of really cool things that you can see in there. All right, we also have a new style of architecture and it is called functionalism. And basically what they're doing, they are stripping out all unnecessary ornamentation, getting it all away, and they're using it all for function or for use. But, and it's cool because it's a little cheaper, but it's also sad because if you've ever looked at the old houses downtown Sioux Falls, the Victorian houses, they have these beautiful, unique features to their house, right? They don't all look the same all kinds of little accents and beautiful things. Well, they went from that to this. We don't need all those accents, right? So we just pay for what we need. Now, there are two people famous for this style. Louis Sullivan is known for this style, functionalism with businesses. And if you look at this building, notice he has stripped away all the extras, right? He is using new things like reinforced concrete and steel frames because they've had a lot of problems with earthquakes and fires in major cities and they want a building that's going to stand up through all of that. And to be honest with you, they pretty much do. They are so solid, they do. Now, it may burn everything and everyone in it, but the building is still standing after a major fire. You'll see the use of electricity for the first time, electric elevators and it is free of all ornamentation. When we look at houses, Frank Lloyd Wright is the most famous functionalist. In fact, there are people that spend lots of money to go and visit every house he ever designed throughout the world. And if you ever go into architecture, you will definitely study these two guys. Here are some examples. Again, we're getting rid of all the excess it is all about long geometric lines. Notice the long lines, right? The lines of the house. The only extra that he basically had was the overhanging roof that you see like right here or right here. That's the only thing that he added that was kind of his stamp of whatever, okay? He's also known for creating the Guggenheim Museum that you see right here. All about function. Then we have our final style of music. It is actually called 20th century music. So remember we had romanticism, right? Now we have 20th century music. 20th century music has very dissonant sounds and very odd rhythms. By dissonant, this is what I mean. If, if you're not a musician, but maybe you've just like pushed the keys on a piano. If you push two keys that are right next to each other, you know how it sounds kind of icky? that's dissonance. So it's not a very pleasant sound always. Okay, when we talk about odd rhythms, if you're listening to your favorite song on the radio, you can like clap to the beat, right? Yeah, and we're clapping to that beat and it's like awesome and we're grooving, right? Okay, well with this kind of song, they're changing time signatures. So it's always changing the beat so it doesn't, you just don't clap to it very easily. So it might go, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, one, two, three, four. And it's just really hard to find that beat. Well, um, one of the most famous 20th century composers is a guy named Stravinsky. He was actually a Russian composer, pianist and conductor, who eventually came to the United States. And he wrote what was called the Rite of Spring, which was a ballet. The music was really, really weird. Um, but not only was the music weird, but his topic was also really controversial. They showed like 
pagan dances and then even a sacrifice of a little girl. They sacrificed her to the God of Spring, which is why they call it uh, the Rite of Spring. Um, because this music and this topic were so controversial, they literally had a riot after this performance. People were freaking out. They just were not happy about what they could hear. Very difficult stuff to play. So I'm going to give you just a sample of what their ballet looks like, a little bit of the music so you can <laughs> Notice that death is a theme. Not your typical ballet, right? Because those notes almost kind of weird, that's that dissonance. Skip to another part. And we'll go to the last part. Oops, not too far. <laughs> for you. So there's an example of 20th century music for you. All right, we also have some other things that are in this chapter. One of those is the beginning of the study of the mind. And the guy that kind of started all of that was a guy named Sigmund Freud. Now, some of his ideas are really weird. And some of them, we actually believe a little bit today. But the point was he started asking those questions. And one of the things he believed was that our mind was kind of like an iceberg and that there are different parts to our mind, all right? So if you look at the top part, the part that's above the water up here, we call that the ego. And this is the part of our mind that restrains our impulses that wouldn't be acceptable. That would be the part of me that knows when I go out to a restaurant, I don't dance on the tables, right? Because it would be inappropriate or I don't burp and fart on a date, okay? That's our ego. Now, just below the surface, we have what's called the super ego. And this is the part of your mind that tells you what's right and wrong. I'm gonna give you a kind of a, a really kind of gross example, but this is what tells you, gentlemen, that you wouldn't rape a girl on a date because you know that that is wrong, right? And then we have this part that's way down deep underneath the water. The part we don't talk about a whole lot. And that is our id. These represent our biological urges and our non-filtered thoughts. Um, and we all have them, right? It's that caveman instinct to kill or be killed, to get food to survive. Um, and if you look at stories of people that have been in like prison camps, there are people that have actually killed other people to get their food or to survive. Sometimes those instincts kick in. Um, and a lot of people believe Freud was on to something. And if you've ever looked at an interview with a serial killer, for example, you'll notice that quite often they don't feel any remorse. They don't realize that killing and raping all these girls was a bad thing. They might feel bad they got caught, but they don't realize it's wrong. And what they believe is that this person that did those terrible things never got past the id portion of the brain. Uh, I'll give you an example. There was one guy that was a serial killer. And when he was a little kid, they locked him in a closet, had no human interaction other than sliding food and water in a doggy door to him 
and he lived basically in the dark as an animal. Well, think about it. If there's nobody teaching him what's right and wrong or what he should and shouldn't be doing, how does that guy know what's correct behavior? It would make sense that he would do things that are not okay in our, in our system of our world. So he was the first guy to really study the human mind. We also have a little bit of Albert Einstein in this chapter, and they're talking about his theory of relativity. Now, I am not a real good scientist person, but I'll give you basically what I got out of this, all right? He believes that if space and time are relative to the observer, that if we disappear, then time and space disappear. So, for example, as long as we're in this room, we know that basically 50 minutes go by while we're in this room. And we're keeping track of that clock. We know what month it is, what day it is, what year it is. But if we are no longer around to keep track of that time, that date, that year, is time really there then? He believed that it disappears. Same thing with me saying, I own this section of land for my, my home. Well, if we're not there to draw those boundaries of land, do they really exist? He believed those things exist only if the observer is there. He also is the person that discovered that basically matter is made up of energy. Everything is, including my body, including this desk right here. Everything in here has energy in it and that they are all made out of little particles like the atom that you see. We also have a little bit of Charles Darwin in this chapter. Talk about some deep thinkers, right? Um, and he talked about social Darwinism or survival of the fittest. Now, we're going to talk about his basic belief first, and then you'll see how this chapter actually applies it to something else. So um, can you think of what survival of the fittest means? Good. It means that basically the animal that can um, fight and exist is the one that lives on. So, for example, a dinosaur wasn't strong enough to survive, therefore they become extinct, right? But in our chapter, they actually apply Darwinism, or survival of the fittest, to countries. So let's look at what they mean by this. National has applied it this way. For example, this little country of Hawaii, these little islands here, if they are not strong enough to defend themselves from invaders, then they will cease to exist as a separate country. They will get eaten up by another stronger nation, like the United States. I think of it kind of like Pac-Man, right? We gobble up and imperialize all those little countries that can't stand up for themselves. At least that's what we did around 1900. Nowadays, we just go in and try to defend them, and then we leave them to themselves. We try to, anyway. But that's what they mean by applying that uh, Darwinism to countries here. All right, we also have Karl Marx mentioned in this chapter. Karl Marx wrote the book, The Communist Manifesto. This book is important because it is basically the Bible of communism. That's really what it is. And in this book, he said, the proletariat or the working class people, the proletariats, are fighting the bourgeoisie or middle class because they're the business owners. And as business owners, we're paying low wages to those proletariat. And so they can never get ahead so that they can buy their own business because we keep them down by not paying them enough. So he actually proposes a communist theory now, this is the part that scares us about communism, and this is why we get into the Cold War in the 1960s, because this book calls for the killing, yes, I said killing, of all democratic people. Completely freaks us out. He says you need to get rid of all democratic people of the world. And the reason for that is because, think about what you have been exposed to. You've been given the freedom to work or not work, 
to climb that ladder and make more money and get all the things that you want. Maybe not necessarily just what you need, but things you want. We've been given that freedom and that drive. Well, he believes that once we've been exposed to greed and things like that, we can never go back to a system where a leader tells us, okay, I'm going to assign a job to you, and you're going to be a garbage collector. And every person in this room, whether you're a doctor or a garbage collector, is going to make $10,000 a year. Now, you're all going to have food on the table. You're all going to get paid the same. We can't handle that because we have been exposed to greed. We want to make more than the next guy. We want to get a raise. So he believed that we needed to kill all people like that. What we didn't understand in the Cold War was that not all countries believed in pure Marxism. Yes, they liked the system of communism, but they weren't going to kill everybody that was democratic necessarily. And that's why we went after people all over the world. I think that is it for today. Thanks.